Okay, so um, ten minute break. Then we're going to do two sessions. One we're going to do in here. That's going to be how to build uh, muscle on a raw food diet. Charlie Abel, he's a personal trainer. He's been a personal trainer how long, Charlie? Seven years? Been bodybuilding since you were 18. Yeah, many, many years. Uh, recently did a bodybuilding contest on a raw food diet, testimonial to that. He's going to be talking about that in here. Um, out this way, underneath, there's a, you look on the wall, there's a sled, sledder on the wall. Underneath that, Doug, myself, and Brendan Brazier are going to give a little presentation on endurance athletics and, and uh, so the cycling, the running, anything like that. So we're going to be over there. Uh, well, welcome everybody, and my name is Charlie Abel, and I'm going to talk about um, building muscles on a raw food diet. We're going to kind of take this, um, so far throughout the day we've been talking, everybody's been talking about a vegan diet, which is a diet absent of animal products. Now we're going to take it into a raw food diet. So maybe I thought I'd spend a little bit giving an introduction on raw foods and why I decided to do it. I've, owned a, I've been bodybuilding myself since I was a teenager, so it's been about 32 years now. I'm 48 right now. And uh, the past six years, I've been a personal trainer, and I gave me a chance to observe the, re the results of training to um, hundreds of, of general public type people. So when I opened up my personal training gym, I just followed the book and did the standard American diet. And you really don't learn stuff about diet till you start reading and educating yourself. So I just went to a lecture one day, and it was sort of a continuing education thing, and I didn't know what I was getting in on, but it was Dr. Doug Lyle, and I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's the author of The Pleasure Trap. And I came out of there, and I was, wasn't was convinced on being a vegan, but I said, that guy sounds pretty convincing, but doggone it, he says not to eat meat. I need my protein. <laughs> so it took a couple months, and I'm just the kind of guy that has to experiment and try stuff out of myself. And I said, okay, I'll do it. I'll try eliminating meat. And I really didn't notice a difference. So I was ate a cooked food vegan diet for like two years there. And in the meanwhile time, I kept on reading all the great classics of nutrition, like Diet for a New America. And, and then, you know, you're reading that book, and there's another book. And then finally, I stumbled across this raw food diet stuff. And I went to, we have um, potlucks, sort of a support group. And I went to the one of those, I go, this is weird. <laughs> I mean, these guys just don't eat anything cooked. They don't eat anything cooked. And these other guys are talking about some stinky fruit from Thailand that they get kicked out of an airport and they're proud of it. And I'm going, I don't know about this. That's a Duran, if you guys haven't figured that out. So again, I said, well, I'll research a little bit. And um, finally, through my readings and stuff, I said, OK, I'll try that too. And what was kind of the turning, what convinced me was a couple of things. One was Dr. Lorraine Day, who got rid of her cancer by diet and lifestyle changes. And I figured, well, if she can get rid of cancer, I guess it ought to be healthy for just someone that doesn't. And two was the argument that said, basically, um, no animals, of all the thousands of species of animals in the world, None of them cook their food except for one, and that's humans. So sounds pretty normal as far as maybe that's what nature designed for. So I said, well, I'll try it. So I experimented on myself. And um, when I went from a cooked food diet, a standard American diet, to a vegan diet, I saw some improvement. And I'd say I saw about the same amount of improvement going to a raw food diet. And um, the biggest um, question, though, is, and why I'm here today, why I was asked to talk is, there's the big thing about on a raw food diet, those guys don't get enough protein, and this guy eats a raw food diet and he bodybuilds too. So that's kind of just the unique thing of, of why I'm here to, to kind of share with you that yeah, it can be done. And I don't know that I need to spend a lot of time about um, protein today. I pretty much had that topic <laughs> gone over and over. Rick Dina did a pretty good talk with that, but usually people have questions of, to me. I've, I've got a website up now, and I've even had people, I list what, I've, what I eat every day, broke it all down, and people still come up and say, okay, come on, tell me what you really eat. Where's the protein, really? They don't think I'm telling the truth. <laughs> but I am kind of unique, and I don't take uh, most uh, vegan or raw food, I think I only know of one sort of raw food bodybuilder I found on the internet, but most bodybuilders and athletes are vegans, 
and they're most, uh, most of them are into some kind of supplements or protein supplements. And I'm basically just experimenting on myself and doing what you've heard today earlier. And I don't take any supplements. I'm just eating whole natural foods. And um, so far, it's been working out good. I was showing this gentleman earlier. They asked me questions in their talk. I have pictures here. He was asking, is it possible to bulk up on a, on a raw food diet? And I want to explain that the whole field of bodybuilding is pretty much a money-making proposition. It's sort of a scam. Not er they kind of lead you into believing that everybody's going to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And as a young teenager, I'm gullible. I'm going to believe that. And, but the main thing is to keep you working out so that you get their magazines, which aren't really magazines. They're magazines. They're really product catalogs to sell you supplements. And um, they want to keep you believing that you can look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And as long as you just maybe just haven't taken the right supplement yet or not enough but you keep spending money so it's a money making proposition but that's not to say the feel of bodybuilding is not worthwhile um, I've made good progress throughout my career I'm, it's one of the happiest things in, that has brought me happiness throughout my life and has been very worthwhile I just want to make the point that we're working in the field of bodybuilding especially genetic limitations uh, your height, your weight, your bone structure, your muscle length um, there's a lot of factors. So I'm saying it's worth doing because everybody can make some improvement. It's just that not everybody's going to look like a bodybuilder. But on a vegan diet and raw food diet, people can make um, good improvements that, that make, make, it, make it worthwhile. Like cyclists, um, we have had in my gym, and he's been working out cycling for a while, but then you put him on a strength training program, and he says, well, it's easier to go up hills now. So you may not look like a bodybuilder, but the strength gains are, are certainly there and worthwhile. So why not do it? Okay. So first I want to start out on some of the benefits of, on a raw food diet relating to strength training. And um, oh, one thing I want to add about a, a cooked food vegan diet versus a raw food diet, the only real advantage of a raw food diet that I've read about, because one of the things that was instrumental to me in sticking to the raw food diet and learning about it once I got on it was that um, Essential Natural Hygiene course, and I have a link to it on my website, but basically it's a big thick course that takes you through all the steps and educates you, and I found that a lot of people start on a raw food diet and stick with it for about a year, and then kind of drop out because it's a little bit tougher than a vegan diet. You've got to line up your foods and find the right fruit, fruit and have it there for you, so it's a little bit tougher. So I found that having the knowledge behind me really kept me on track, so once you know about what to do, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna stick with it. But the main advantage of a, a raw food diet is that they said is when you expose food to heat, it kills nutrients, destroys vitamins. And there's one doctor, I don't know his name, Kushroff or something like that, I can't even pronounce it, um, showed in the studies how white blood cells increased um, in response to cooked food. So I can't tell you from my own experience that that's true, and I can only repeat what I've, what I've read, and, but I can tell you my own experiences when I get to those. Um, but one thing that um, a cooked food vegan diet does, one, it avoids a lot of harmful animal products, but one thing cooked food does is it supplies, supplies a very useful nutrient, and that's calories. It's very useful for getting enough calories, because when we get to a raw food diet, the whole paradigm changes from what you have in a standard American diet and a little bit less in a, in a vegan diet is there, especially in standard American diet, it's very easy to get calories. But in a raw food diet, thing switches to where now, instead of having too many calories, we have to strive to get enough calories. And that's one of the biggest things I found is people think that they're not protein deficient when in fact they're calorie deficient. So basically repeat what Dr. Dean was saying, if you get enough calories, the protein's there. So well, I've heard, had people come to my talks and say, can I work out? It's like they're on a raw food diet. They find they don't, there's like, they're not working out. And I go, well, what's stopping you? It's like they have to ask me for permission. And it's like the diet's adequate. Just go do it. But I'll give you some hints on how to get enough calories. Okay. So um, some of the benefits of the raw food diet is that we gain energy because your body's expending less on digestion. Because when we eat a heavy meal, you know, like after Thanksgiving, everybody's lethargic, they're digesting that, your body has to expend an enormous amount of energy to extract calories, like Brendan Brazier was talking about earlier. Also, it has to synthesize digestive enzymes to digest that food. So once you take that away and give it fruit, basically, is what I'm eating, and I'll go over my diet a little bit, it's not all fruit. Um, 
give it foods that are easy and spend less energy, these fruits digest very easily, so there's more energy and it's easier to, to extract the energy from food. So you've it's saved a lot of energy. And it's common for a lot of raw foodists to need less, less sleep. They start reporting they need only four, five or six hours of sleep. And I'll tell you what happens there. I still need my eight, nine hours of sleep. Because what happens is you, at, if I don't work out, yeah, I only need five or six hours of sleep. But now I've got all this energy, so I work out harder and tire myself out. So I end up needing more sleep. So it's like a catch-22. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> it's just you work out hard. <laughs> so, and also, the benefit of a raw food diet is now you're working with a healthy body instead of a body that's these underlying degenerative diseases building up. So I say that muscle building is good because first of all the human body is, I believe is designed to thrive on strenuous exercise. And the visible effect of having a healthy body with larger muscles from working out is it shows that all systems are working fine. If you just imagine if you've got a diseased liver or something brewing your not, body's not going to respond. I've even had one lady who um, came to me as a personal training client that she just didn't respond to exercise. I don't know, I just said, something was fishy here. Send her to a doctor, she's got cancer. So it's a good indicator of, of general overall health. But the biggest thing I say, the advantage of a strength training on a raw food diet is everybody's worried about the protein issue. And I tell them this is like a meter to gauge your protein. If you're working out and you're getting stronger, you're adding muscle tissue, how can you be deficient in protein? It's not going to happen. So it's, and then you watch your strength. If your strength starts going down for any reason, well, check your protein. But that kind of gives people a little encouragement. So, well, yeah, I guess, I guess the protein takes the protein issue out, out of it a little bit. And one of the other things I've noticed, when I was working out hard in my 20s, I got to the point, one, and I've tried pretty much all training routines, but one I did was um, we were working out five days a week, two hours a day and we're pushing ourselves hard and it can lead to overtraining but at the time it's like you know I always went 100% what I did and I eat a lot of protein foods meat, fish, dairy, milk, gallon of milk a day, all that stuff and I had this like brain fog and everything's cloudy all the time and I've noticed the big thing now is my muscle fatigue and stuff but my mind's clear so I'd say that's a big advantage. Okay. Any questions on anything there? We're gonna let me go a little bit. Yes. How old are you? Sir? 48. Do you know anything about people who are older than 48 in terms of increasing muscle mass after certain years? Is there a, a plateauing even for somebody, say, a vegan? Um, again, I think it depends upon the person's overall health and their genetics and that sort of thing. But I've had, I've worked out clients as old as 80. And I have one guy that was 77 that was just a dynamo. And he was on a standard American diet. And he was pretty muscular. But Whereas you know any older vegans, I guess that's what I'm looking for. Um, no, because my, most of my clients is the same old story. You try to tell try to tell them about a vegan diet, and they balk, and they take you know, it's it's. But but I basically I tell I didn't give up because exercise is. I said if exercise is good for you. I don't care what diet you're on. Exercise is good for you. But I have worked out with um, people as old as 80, and my mom has she's got biceps at 78. So <laughs> basically, as long, I think as long as the demand for muscle is there, put up on your body, it's going to respond the best it can according to within its limitations. Okay. So let's go on. We've got the benefits of a raw food diet. Common mistakes of a raw food diet is two main ones. Okay. On a standard American diet, most people are eating 35, 30 to 40% fat. Okay, and they're used to that because they eat a meal, they feel full, they feel satisfied, and it keeps them from eating every, every um, they don't eat for three or four hours. Okay, and then they get to a raw food diet, and when I first started on a raw food diet, I was famished. It was like, give me food all day long, you can't get enough. You eat, you're just not satisfied. And people don't like that. They got a job, they got to eat, I mean, they can't be eating all the time. So um, they'll go to a high fat diet. So what happens is frequently on a raw food diet, they're eating a higher fat percentage than they are on a standard American diet. And it, I don't think it's quite as harmful because it's, it's plant fats versus animal fats, but still, I really like what Doug Graham says, the 80-10-10. I get my percentage down to about 10%. So one is they'll eat a lot of nuts. And you do need nuts on a, on a raw food diet because in this good book by Dr. Vetrano, 
she's a natural hygienist that does a raw food diet. She lives in Texas. It explains how years ago people would go on an all fruit diet. And she explained how they do really good at first, but then after about six months, they start showing signs of a long-term protein deficiency. So she recommends, um, she found that after about two weeks of reintroducing nuts back into their diet, they all do a rapid turnaround and come right, bounce right back. Oh, the book is called Errors in Hygiene by Dr. Vetrano, and it's advertised in Living Nutrition magazine. So it's a pretty good read. Okay, and in it she talks about some of the symptoms of protein deficiency, which I happen to have here. Early symptoms of protein deficiency are weight loss, listlessness, apathy, slow healing of wounds, edema, skin and hair changes, decreased endurance, and easily irritated personality. Next, the enamel will dissolve off the teeth due to insufficient high quality saliva to re-enamel the teeth after eating acid fruits. Also very dry skin, loss of hair, extreme sleepiness, and weakness. Also diminished secretion of the glandular part of the pituitary gland causing a low basal metabolic rate. Low grade, long standing cases develop a flaky paint areas of hyperpigmentation. These are large dark spots that do not shine like healthy skin and are slightly rough. You frequently you see like a protein deficiency in alcoholics. Basically they're, eating, they're not eating food, they just get on extreme alcohol, um, extreme alcoholics, nothing, you know, they're very deficient. You'll see signs of protein deficiency. Um, so what I recommend is basically, we'll go over my diet uh, a little bit more in detail, but basically I'm eating mostly fruits, vegetables, and um, just a half a cup of nuts a day. Because people are surprised, well don't you eat a lot of protein? No, half a cup of nuts is a day. Because realize all the fruits, like I said, they're in the five to six whatever percent range of protein, like Dr. Dean was saying, and that seems to be adequate. But you do need the nuts for something that's missing in the fruits like essential fatty acids, I think, is what it is. We'll go over the diet a little bit more. So that's one mistake, is going to a high fat diet. And what I say is to overcome that is don't go to the high fat diet. I've experimented with nuts. I've experimented my diet, eating tons of nuts and then cutting back to, to a half a cup a day and I eat my nuts first thing in the morning so I wouldn't be hungry all morning and then eat the nuts at noon time and then I find that nuts for me are best on a salad at dinner time and I'll eat fruits at the beginning of the day up to that point. Okay. Um, so the second um, mistake is not getting enough calories by people eating vegetables. They think that a raw food diet is basically vegetables and they've heard bad things about fruits. And the problem with vegetables is that, and let me write this little chart down here uh, to back up a little bit about the standard American diet. Remember I talked about how the par whole paradigm has changed from getting trying to, uh, getting too many calories to trying to get enough calories. Let's look at some typical foods that the standard American diet provides. Okay, let's say you go into, we're just, I've um, reduced them to the calories per pound of food so you can see the relative calorie density. Okay, so a double patty large hamburger. Okay, we got hamburger is roughly 7,859 calories per pound. Hamburger. Hamburger. I'm going to abbreviate that. Ice cream comes in at 4505 ice cream. Pizza, 1047. Pizza. And cheese, 1828. Cheese. And bread, 898. Okay, we're going to show you, this is a category here of the standard American diet. In contrast, let's look what nature provides for us. We've got bananas at 403 calories per pound. We've got dates, 1256. Apricots, 217. Grapes, 313. Peaches, 176. Um, tomatoes, I got 95. Avocado, 757. That's for a whole pound of them, which I've tried eating a whole pound of avocados. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing, don't need that much. 
Avocado, okay. And watermelon, 136. Okay, so these are basically fruits in this category. And then we've got vegetables. A whole pound of lettuce is going to run you about 68 calories. Celery, 63. Broccoli, 100. And carrots, 186. So see, if somebody eating a standard American diet, if you average their daily food intake, look at how high it's going to be about, okay? Raw food diet, fruits and vegetables, whole natural foods that exist in nature, look what they're running. Probably about, well, 400 <coughs> bananas, a couple hundred. And lettuce and celery. So the second major mistake that I run across is people eating basically vegetables, juicing, uh, green juice and that sort of thing. They're very low in calories. To get 2,000 calories, roughly, let's round this off to 100 calories per pound. You're going to have to get 2,000 calories. You're going to have to eat 20 pounds of food in a day. You're going to be like a cow grazing all day long. You're going to get tired of chewing. Whereas fruits, I've done studies on myself where I've eaten about 7 to 8 pounds of fruit and I can get enough calories in a day. So that's definitely doable. Sounds like a lot of food and people tell me, well, I don't think I can do that raw food diet because you're eating about 20 bananas a day. And I just don't think I can eat that many bananas. And I said, fine, take away your bacon, your eggs, and your toast in the morning, all that stuff. You're going to be pretty hungry. Huh? You're going to see those bananas disappear quick. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, let's see back to where I was here. So that was basically the second mistake. We'll go over my diet a little bit more, and I'll show you why bananas are a big key. The protein issue. Let me go on to that. Do I need to talk about protein? Other than, <laughs> if you get it, basically the biggest thing is, is a calorie deficiency. People are hungry all the time. They're used to eating a banana. And I say eat a meal of bananas. They eat one and then they're hungry 20 minutes later. Doesn't work. You've got to get enough calories. So that's why in my diet, bananas is one of my mainstays. Like I said, the whole thing has changed to trying to get enough calories. People say, well, why don't you just eat other fruits like apricots and other stuff? Because they're not as calorie dense as bananas. When I eat a meal, I'll have four bananas and I weigh this, roughly a pound of bananas, and I'll have that every hour and a half. And um, that way, if I have a pound of something else, it, it fills you up maybe even more, so you're getting not quite a pound, so you're getting fewer. So I found my mainstay is bananas. I was even talking with Bradley the other day you know, on some rides. He's eating to get enough calories with as much riding he does. He'll eat 40 bananas a day, and we're going, what would we do without bananas? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> So anyway, bananas are a big thing. So basically the main challenge to gaining weight um, is getting enough calories and that's why, uh, I just said that, bananas again. Um, so sample eating plan for me is I start basically in the morning when I'm, when I wait for that hunger signal. When you first get up in the morning it's like your body's warming up, it's not ready for a big meal. Some of the signs, um, some of the um, negative aspects I've got uh, uh, feedback from people on raw food and myself is you get kind of this, you eat a fruit meal and you get kind of a queasy feeling, you have kind of feel, and you get this kind of this spacey feel. I still get that once in a while because I'm not totally tuned into my body signals all the time. But basically, what I've found that comes from is one, eating when you're really not hungry. Just get up in the morning and eating because it's time to eat. It's better to let your body go through that warm-up stage in the morning and wait till it's really hungry. So I found first thing in the morning, I can't jump right into bananas. But there are certain foods that are not as sweet that I can. I can eat up a couple tomatoes, maybe a little bit of melon, half a melon or so. Um, certain foods like that that are not sweet. Cucumbers. And then around 9 o'clock, I can start on, on some bananas. So, and then the other thing is that queasy feeling. So that comes from basically eating when you're not hungry or eating too much at one time, too big of a meal. In general, I like, like so late, later in the day, instead of eat, I could, my stomach will hold eight or nine bananas and if I stuff myself, but I found I do much better on eating about half full and then eating more often and not stuffing. So that's one thing that queasy feeling can come from. And also, I like, after every fruit meal, I like to, because a lot of fruitists have complained about tooth decay. And it's like, we're here to get healthy. Why do we want to jump into something that's going to give us tooth decay? Um, 
that may be due to hybridized fruit or something. I don't know that. But what I've found that works good for me that I read about is eat lettuce, cucumber, or celery after each fruit meal. And what it does, it helps the fiber in there, helps clean off your teeth from the saliva. Um, and also the fiber in your goes in your stomach from the lettuce and stuff helps slow down the rate of sugar absorption. And it help, also helps empty your stomach empty out a little bit faster. So um, lost my train of thought there on the fiber. Tooth decay. Tooth decay, yeah. Um, it cleans the teeth. And also, one, th oh yeah, one thing bodybuilders do throughout the day, if anybody's in tune with bodybuilding, they like, they like to eat small protein meals throughout the day. They like to give their protein a body they think it's more usable at small doses throughout the day. So if you know from, remember from Dr. Dina's talk, he talks about how vegetables are very high in protein like lettuce and stuff. So that's what basically what you're doing is giving small doses of a high protein food um, throughout the day, which and remember one of the symptoms of a low protein, uh, protein inadequacy is the enamel dissolving off the teeth. So it's very important to get the lots of greens in your diet to help clean the teeth but also give the body the proteins to build healthy saliva to keep the teeth healthy. So I haven't had a problem with tooth decay and I've been 100% raw for three years now. Okay. So let's see here. Challenges of gaining weight, sample eating plan. So like I said, I started at 7 a.m. Here's one day I did. I had two oranges or fruit in season. So it's kind of like, you know, what's handy with some lettuce leaves. Let me erase this here. I'm going to go on to something else. And then I wait an hour, hour and a half or so, 8 a.m. I had some, I had 35 strawberries with some lettuce leaves. 9 a.m. I'm ready to go again, four bananas. 10.30, hour and a half later, four bananas with lettuce. 12 noon, four bananas. 1.30, four bananas. <laughs> 3 o'clock, four bananas. I go to the grocery store and she goes, you guys have a monkey. <laughs> I said, no, I'm just a primate. <laughs> but then about 4.30, I'm tired of bananas. So I'll have, try to have some other fruit. Because you do want to not, bananas are a mainstay, but you also want to have as big a variety as you can too. So by then, I'm, like I said, I'll have, try to have some different fruits in the morning and late at 4.30 or so, try a couple of different ones. And then I found through experimentation, uh, dinner time is best time to have my large salad. So not only am I eating lettuce or kale or celery and cucumbers throughout the day with my fruit, but dinner time is a plate that big, has a whole head of lettuce with stuff like cucumbers, broccoli, cauliflower, sweet red peppers, tomatoes, and their half cup of nuts. And like the other people talking earlier, I take my nuts and soak them for, in water for 24 hours before I eat them, which helps the digestion make it a little easier. Which nuts do you use? I vary. Um, throughout the nuts, I like almonds, uh, macadamias, pistachios, walnuts. And if you eat avocado, you can, for that day, instead of nuts, you'd have an avocado. Okay, so sunflower seeds, yeah, all work. So just, uh, again, variety is the key because they all have different nutrients. We've had pumpkin seeds too. Question? Would, uh, do you put any, I don't know, you would dressing? dressing or? I did it first. You can make a lot of good dressings. Like I, we had Doug Graham's cookbook, how he talks about making dressings. You need something with an acid, like a citrus fruit. So we made various combinations like you take almonds with oranges, almonds with grapefruit or pistachios. Sunflower seeds of grapefruit and make it around. But something with fatty would be your nuts and something with a bite would be your citrus. And you can pour that over the top. But generally, I just like to slice up the tomatoes, pour the nuts on, and just kind of eat it like that. It's, kinda, it's quicker and easier. I don't have to clean the blender. <laughs> and then about because I'm trying to get as much food into myself because I want to have adequate calories because the studies I've seen on strength training show that muscle seems to be added to the body when you have a slightly slightly more calories than you need. You seem to gain a little bit better on, on, the, on the gaining part. And that's one trick I did. At 6 o'clock I have my salad with the nuts. So we want to get normally a fatty food like nuts will take three or four hours to digest. But instead we want to get them out of your stomach as quick as we can. So one, you eat it with the, all the fiber in a salad that helps your stomach empty. And also you soak them to make them a little more digestible. So then about 8 o'clock before bedtime I'm getting hungry again. And I know a lot of places, places say, people say, don't eat before bedtime. But I'm saying, sometimes I can't sleep. My stomach's growling. I need to eat. 
So I and and my my son, he's baby, you know, babies eat and they go right to sleep. So and plus, if you eat something that digests quick, like dates, first of all, you're going to get a lot of calories in from dates, and they digest pretty quick. So I don't think it's it's a big deal. And sometimes I still wake up in the middle of the night and. My wife will get up and eat a banana in the middle of the night. So, I, and then before, so I'm getting asked before dinner time, I'll have some, a meal of dates. I'll eat 30, 40, sometimes 60 dates. And that's a good, so, good source of calories. <laughs> yes? You have a problem with having to get up several times during the night to pee. Yes, yes, yes I do. do, do? Um, basically, I'm eating a water sufficient diet. <laughs> I'm eating a water sufficient diet. And people ask me, do you drink water? And I said, no, I don't. Don't have to. Uh, and you have to monitor yourself. If you're doing something strenuous like a marathon out in the heat and you're um, sweating profusely and your urine is very little and very bright yellow, you need more water. But I don't do that. I'm not an endurance athlete. And I, I, like I said on my experiment, I, I did seven or eight pounds of food. I also measured my urine output for the day. And I got 84 ounces that day. And I put it for effect to fill up two big old pitchers. And I got all this pee. <laughs> <laughs> Ask my wife. Sometimes I'm running because I got to go. And then basically I, I. Half those times at night? Uh, yeah, probably because that salad and that and are very water and the tomatoes are very watery and along with the dates because the dates are sort of a semi-dried food so I like to eat a lot of uh, celery and cucumber with it to kind of bring the water content of that meal back up. So I am usually three or four times during the night. Oh yeah. That's the problem we have and it yeah. is a problem. Sometimes I can't yeah. get back to sleep. Oh, I don't have a problem. <laughs> 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 But anyway, I, uh, at this point, I wanted to point out, everybody says, Where do you, where's your protein, okay? Um, you need meat, you need dairy, you need fish, you need eggs to get your protein. Here's my 18 pounds of protein my wife's carrying. My wife, the whole time before she got pregnant or I got pregnant, she hasn't eaten meat, fish, so none of those protein foods are in her diet, but yet there's a healthy baby boy growing. Um, without those protein foods, so the plant diet is is, is general is very adequate. Very healthy pregnancy, no problem. Yeah. Popped it right out. Popped it right. Well, she didn't pop it right out. <laughs> okay. Also, I did. Um, there's a, a web on my website. There's a web another website I talk about called Nutri Diary that um, Tim Trader's uh, Lori Masters is Tim Trader's girlfriend. She told me about it, where you can plug in the foods you eat every day and it'll give you a breakdown as far as the amount of vitamins and minerals you're getting and also the fat, protein, and um, carbohydrate content. So what I figured out on mine was on a typical day, pardon me, it's a website called NutriDiary. Here, let me put that down. Why don't you put your son too? Okay, NutriDiary. Dot com and it's free. You just sign in, register, and, and there's no charge because they get advertisements on it. Are my website. website yeah, that's a link to that on my website. My website's on that speakers list, but it's Charlie's Gym. Gym. Dot info. Okay, so what I ended up with here's my. I just. This is the total amounts. Um, like remember I said, eat, uh, greens are important, eat a lot of greens. So for I have kale, 10 ounces. So if you know how light a leaf of kale is, weigh out 10 ounces, that's a lot of kale. And a lot of this is homegrown. Let me touch on that right now, is the vitamin B12 issue. I've listened to a lot of experts and I'm still convinced that I don't think anybody has the complete answer yet. <laughs> but I think there's a lot of things leaning in that direction. And because one guy says, um, well, B12 is made by bacteria in your gut and it's absorbed that way. And the next guy says, well, it's made in your colon, but it's absorbed in your small intestine. And the small intestine is before your colon, so it goes out, so how do you absorb it? And then the next guy says, well, um, it's because the bacteria is, our food is so sterile that there's no bacteria on our food. And I'm going, well, they don't cook the food. They don't sterilize it. He says, no, it's the soil because of synthetic fertilizers and not he healthy bacteria growth in the soil. So therefore, our soil is deficient in bacteria. So um, my solution to the B12 thing is I haven't monitored or checked myself. I'm just doing fine because I've heard that some people do Without B12 supplements, some people only last a year or two. Others have gone 20, 25 years, and they're doing fine. So that kind of tells me they don't really know the complete answers. But what I do is, we grow, my answer is grow as much of your own food as you can. And um, 
that way you know it's organic, you know it's grown well, and even the, the, the food kind of goes in categories, like the, the organic grocery store is fine, but what tastes better than that is farmer's market stuff. And what tastes better than the farmer's market stuff is homegrown. Nothing beats homegrown. And it may sound a little gross to some people, but there's a book called The Human Manure Handbook. <laughs> and basically it talks about composting your own <laughs> feces, basically, and it answers, it's a very funny book. It's got Adventures of Mr. Turdley in there. <laughs> and it talks about all the hygienic issues, and the guy's done it. It's a classic book. Um, by Joe Jenkins, it's Jenkins Publishing, and um, he talks about how to safely do it, and his family's been doing it for years, and I did it in my, um, within the city limits, and nobody ever smelled a thing if you keep it covered properly, and we've been using it, and the vegetables grow fine. So that's my answer <laughs> to that, was, even without that, but grow your own, basically, is the V12 thing. So um, my breakdown, oh, sorry, so we had kale 10 ounces, cucumber 12 ounces, lychee, I had some tropical fruits that day, 11 ounces, grapefruit 12 ounces, strawberries 2 ounces, bananas, a whole 62 ounces of bananas. So what is that? About 5 pounds. Nectarines 10 ounces, peaches 12 ounces, broccoli 4 ounces, cauliflower, I won't go the amounts, um, red pepper, tomatoes, another 6 ounces of lettuce. We had hemp seeds that day and dates and celery. What that broke down, my calories was 35.89. Fat was 50 grams. Cholesterol, zero, I want to write down. Sodium, 405, but carbos, carbs, was 811 grams. And protein, drum roll please, 84 grams. More than enough. And what that broke down to was protein, 8%. Fat, 11%. And carbs, 81%. And that's why I like Dr. Doug Graham's 80-10-10 is without even trying and eating according to how he says it automatically falls into about 80-10-10. Okay. And along with that, and I won't write it down, but we got vitamin A. Uh, these are percentages of a 2,000 calorie diet, so I got more than that. But my vitamin A was like 1,431% of normal. Vitamin C, 2,374%. Calcium was 99%. Iron, 114%. When I think about calcium is people say, what about enough calcium on a raw food diet? Leafy greens is what I read have that. Um, but I say, if you're worried about calcium, first, get all the stuff out of your diet that robs your body of calcium. And then I think you should have get rid of the soft drinks, the alcohol, the tobacco, prescription drugs, all that, all that stuff. And then um, you're not, since nothing's robbing your body of calcium, you should have enough from your leafy greens. And that's why leafy greens are important. Like I said, it's a balance between your nuts. Like I said, just enough. Leafy greens are good, but again, you get tired of eating greens. And you go to fruit and you get tired of fruit. It's a balance between the two. Okay. Let's go back to my, that pretty much covers it for the raw food diet. Okay. Um, questions on that? How about you? When you find time to work out between all the <laughs> munching and bananas. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the next topic. And that is, I do what's called, well, Everybody got my website. High intensity training. Okay, and that involves basically um, short and sweet and hard workouts. Um, basically, the difference between high intensity is, um, and conventional, you have conventional bodybuilding is what was popularized by Arnold Schwarzenegger in his Pumping Iron movie. And basically, the theory there is more is better. And they talked about, well, his, Arnold's competitors say, if Arnold's doing 20 sets, I'll do 30 sets. And Arnold hears, well, if he's doing 30, I'll, just more is better. I say, enough is, is enough. And is it, what you want is just enough to stimulate muscle growth, the minimum amount possible. And basically, for me, um, it's Monday, Wednesday, and Friday workouts, about 30 to 45 minutes is about what it takes. I've done my best. I've worked, I've pretty much tried everything. I've tried workouts less than that. I've tried the super slow workouts once every 7 to 10 to 14 days and got small on that. And I've tried five days a week, two hours a day, and just got burned out on that. So a moderate amount, um, very hard, um, works just fine. Uh, works the best for me as far as I got my results. So um, conventional training, what you do basically is you stop early before you've 
done as many as you can do. You do a set of bench presses, you do set, let's see, we got benches. Let's say you do 135 pounds, you do it eight times, and you stop when you get to eight. Maybe you could have done 10 or 12, and then you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again. Maybe you're getting to where you can just barely get eight in the last set. Then you go on to your second exercise. So you've got three or four exercises where you've done kind of sub-maximal. Instead, what I'll do is, like for the chest, you do your chest fly. Oops. We do our chest fly to failure, meaning if you just go to not eight, and once you can't get it up anymore, that's where you failed. Okay, yeah, thank you. Let's chest fly. <laughs> I was doing curls here. So you do your fly, if you do eight, say eight reps to failure, and then you go to a chest press, eight reps to failure, and then right away, without you don't rest between these, you get off this machine, get on that machine, get on back onto a different fly for eight reps, and then so you get on, back onto a different, we'll put dips for the chest. So in four sets, I've totally burned them out, short and sweet, get it done with. Because basically the mechanism for adding muscle is mechanical. You've got to do it by exercising. That's the biggest thing in bodybuilding. Everybody's looking for some secret so they don't have to, it's about hard work. They're looking for some way not to work hard and some magic food that's going to aim, gain um, muscle to their body. You've even seen ads, this tends to promote lean weight and uh, muscle weight in humans. Well, you got to work for it. You can't just eat the food and expect lean muscle weight. So basically what is the mechanism for muscle growth is to basically to attempt to do something you haven't done before. Because your body has a, what your normal daily activities, it grows to a certain point and then it stops. It just has a, a reserve ability above that. So basically, here's how, if we were to graph that, you know, you go out and you lift the dog, you lift the kid, you lift groceries, you're basically going to normal activities in this range and above and beyond that, like everybody today could go out and do some chin-ups. You don't normally do chin-ups, but your body has that strength in reserve in case you need to do that in case of emergency. So by raising your daily activity through exercise, you give it a spike through exercise, and now it says, this is our daily activity from now on. We've got to maintain a reserve above that so the body starts to grow and maintain, it likes to maintain a reserve in case of emergencies. And you just told it you're going to give it these exercise spikes. So now it's going to have a reserve above that so it starts to grow. Okay. Oops, broke the pen. So by exercise, very hard exercise, that's how we put muscle on the body. Let's see. So you're choosing a weight that you, I mean, you'd say if you're exercising until failure, that something that within eight reps, Eight to twelve reps, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So this was the high, it's called high intensity training, and it was popularized by Arthur Jones, who basically revolutionized the fitness industry in the 1970s. Before that, it was just the more is better thing, and along comes Arthur. I'll be get to you in a minute. Arthur Jones, that produced the youngest Mr. America ever. He's age 19, and he worked out three days a week for about an hour and a half a week. And everybody goes, wow, how'd you do that? Well, first of all, he was dealing with the genetic superior. Not everybody could do that, um, but still the training is good for most people because most people are just overtraining. Okay, question. When you work with heavier weights on a shorter period of time, how do you not get too much strain or you, if you're not warmed up? Um, basically the first, I haven't had, you, first of all, you got to use proper form because right. a lot of people in the gym are basically throwing the weights around and the first couple, um, Repetitions are earlier warm up if you're just careful with them. Um, sure, so there's lower weight. No, I use the heaviest weight. I jump right in as heavy as I can. It's basically because you're not resting between sets, the body gets warmed up. So I'll start out with calf raises, and that gets the blood flowing, and then I'll slowly ease into things. But the, each exercise itself, like say if you do your chest, you're doing chest fly, chest press, chest fly, dips, and you go on your back, your back has already gotten some work from that, so it is warmed up. And at the same time, you're breathing, your pulse are elevated, so your body's ready to go for it. Okay. Question? Are you working out each body part three times a week? Yes. I find it seems like that body part needs it that frequently to maintain. I do best on, on gaining size that, that way. Yes. You said about eight reps or to failure. How many sets? Uh, one set of each. 
one set of each. But each muscle group will get two or three sets because we're doing different exercises. And I think there's an advantage to doing um, different exercises rather than straight sets. And I'll explain the, how that works. Okay. Um, yeah, I wanted to get more into working out here. Okay, the typical bodybuilder is going to do, let's say, well, let's talk about chest muscles, okay? Um, he's going to do four, a set of chest flies, and this rest is in the buddy gets on, and he gets back onto a set of chest flies. So you're doing four sets of chest flies by themselves. Well, let's get back to the whole point of exercise is what? To stimulate muscle growth by weakening, fatiguing that muscle as deep as we can momentarily, correct? Okay. So let's take chest. What we want to do first is, well, a beginner, let's go carry this a little bit further. A beginning routine is just basically most people starting out and haven't worked out before. They're just sedentary life. Well, they're going to respond to just not very many exercises. So a typical routine, we're going to do one, calf raises. For, and calves are a kind of exception. Let's go 15 to 25 reps there. And you want to do a leg press, um, 8 to 12 reps. So that pretty much covers your lower body for a beginner. And then we'll go on to a chest press, chest press um, for the chest, and a pull down for the back, lat, lat, back and biceps. And then an overhead press for the shoulders, and six uh, bi um, biceps, bicep curl, and triceps. Okay? So for a beginner, for the first three or four weeks, um, they can start out with, say, He's going to do 15, say you get, for, let's just take the chest press, okay? You put 100 pounds on there, and your first workout, you get 12 reps. Weight's too light, you got 12. So let's go up next workout. This is Monday, this is Wednesday, and Friday. Then he goes up, uh, let's go up to 105 pounds times 12 reps. You got 12, okay? 110, you keep adding 5 pounds of workout till the reps start coming down. So let's say you get, finally, next week, you get to 120 and you get 10. Oh, it's starting to get heavy. Then you go up, five, add 5 pounds, then you go up to 125, and let's say you get 8. Okay. And then you'd weigh, and you could try 130. If you still get 8, keep going up. If you get dropped down to 6 or 7, then get it back up to 8 before you increase the weight. So a beginner will make progress on that. And I mean, a beginner is no problem. Everybody's going to gain the first 6, eight, 8 weeks. That's no problem. After a while, this starts getting not hard. The body starts adapting. And especially on a raw food vegan diet, you're going to adapt a lot faster. You find the body adapts pretty darn quick. Okay, so let's make this harder now. Instead of for the chest, just doing a chest press, we're going to pre-exhaust it. Okay, we're going to, instead we're going to add exercise in here. So for the chest, we're going to do a chest fly first and then a chest press. Okay, so let's talk about what's going on a chest press. You're doing a pushing movement like this. You're using the triceps and the chest muscles. They work together. These muscles, the chest muscles are larger and stronger, and the triceps are a smaller muscle. So that means when you get to the eighth one, you can't get it up anymore. The triceps are giving out before the chest muscles are worked thoroughly. Okay? So for a beginner, that'll work. Okay? More advanced, what we want to do is kind of even these two out. Okay? We want to first isolate just the chest muscles. Take the triceps out of the picture and do a chest fly. So we're just isolating the chest muscles. Now, and think of these, I like to think of these as a chain. Okay, here's your, and remember the weakest link theory of a chain. So you've got the larger link for your chest muscles and the smaller link for your triceps. So the triceps are going to give out first because they're a the smaller link before the chest muscles are fully fatigued. What we want to do is kind of even these links out so they're both about the same. So how do we do that? First fatigue the chest muscles. And then while these are still fatigued, jump right on the chest press. Now the triceps are strong and fresh. The chest muscles fatigued. The triceps, because they're strong and fresh, they'll put the chest muscles in a deeper fatigue and stimulate growth that you didn't on just a plain chest press. Okay? So that's called pre-exhaustion by bypassing one muscle and, and target isolating one and then hitting a the compound movement afterwards. Okay? An isolation movement is where you have one muscle, um, one joint rotation around one joint is isolation movement for the chest, and a compound movement is where you have rotation around two joints, the elbow and the shoulder, we're using the triceps. Carry that further for an advanced subject. We've done that, and now after the chest press, let's go back to the chest fly and just work the pecs again. While we're doing that, the triceps are given a chance to recuperate and we go right back on the chest press 
and now, now the triceps have a chance to recuperate. They're fresh again. They can push the chest muscles to an even deeper failure. So I'm saying you get a much deeper fatigue to your target muscles by alternating exercises using different muscles to help fatigue you deeper than you do by just doing straight sets of chest fly and then straight sets of chest press. Okay, so that's sort of more advanced. Yes, sorry. Have you experimented around with comprising an entire workout of, um, let's say, large movements such as like tr uh, pull-ups, as an example, because they engage forearms, your biceps, your triceps, your your deltoids, your lats, your chest, everything. Yes. Um, because there are a lot of people comprising uh, a workout with strictly um, isolation exercises. Um, the compound movements are good because they involve a lot of um, muscle group muscles in in one movement. However, um, I think you've got, there's a big advantage to doing the isolation movements and using the compound the other um, extra uh, muscle groups to your advantage through compound movements, like like, like I was just talking about here. What he's experienced more muscle growth by. Yeah, because you're just you're you're able to fatigue them deeper than you can in a compound movement. You use it to your advantage. Okay. So and I say on my website, I have an I have a little breakdown of different routines that I've used during the past year. Um, I talk about how I was doing three days a week and had good muscle growth and decided to enter a bodybuilding contest. And then the last few weeks for the contest, I go, oh, what's the best routine? It works the best. So I cut it down to two, and I think I was and only eight exercises and only compound movements. And I think what happened is I slowly started losing muscle tissue um, the last few weeks before the contest because I kept on that routine the next couple of weeks and then I just, you just start looking not as sharp. And you can maintain it for a couple of weeks, but then after a couple of months you start losing and I back to three days a week and you get back, start coming back up to where you were. So I'm staying with three days a week and, and more, more sets like that. But in general, that is a high intensity approach. I know it's more sets than one set, but in general, one set, um, you've got to work extremely hard. <laughs> and even this is, it, you've got to work extremely hard. It gets to the point where you want to just quit, and um, that's when it's getting hard enough. Because uh, you look in the gym, people got lightweight, and they're looking around like that, and they're wondering why they're not getting real. They're not working hard enough. This is, I'm talking hard work. Okay. Yes? How do you balance the weight training with any type of? I don't do any cardiovascular work. Um, I'm not an endurance athlete, and basically my pulse and, and breathing are elevated throughout the full 45 minutes. So that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So basically you're going through your entire exercise routine with no rest? Yeah. And once in a while I'll catch my breath. I'm, not, I'm right now I'm working out by myself, so I've got to set up the machines and stuff. But when I say right now I'm doing about 25 sets and it takes me about 45 minutes. So that's probably two minutes per machine. You've got to keep moving. But when I'm by myself, I'm in the ideal situation, we have all the machines set up and you just jump off one and jump the other. But even then, it, it takes a lot to get into it. Uh, one thing I will tell you about when you do this type of routine, jumping in, I went from you know, the standard training into this. And what I found was all my weights went down. And I go, well, how can this be working? And you start shrinking. Take your rest and slowly decrease the rest period between and keep your weights up. Don't drop your weights in order to finish this because I said do it in 15 minutes or a short period of time. You'll find that your body will slowly decrease the amount of time it takes very rapidly within every workout. You'll start seeing your time go down. Okay. Anybody questions on that? I want to go on to one other critical topic. Okay. And that's how to make progress on this routine. And it's what, something I discovered very recently that's critical. And that is, let's say, so we're going to have a sample routine. It could be longer than this. And how are we doing on time? Wrap it up. Wrap it up? Okay. Okay. Critical on this. <laughs> let's say you got your eight exercises here. And your, this one's uh, 100 pounds, whatever exercise. 100 pounds to eight reps, okay? You just keep adding weight, like I said, five pounds every workout or so, as long as your rep's in there. But it's going to get to a point, realize your body can't keep adding weight like that forever. It's going to get to a point where it does plain get stuck. What do you, that's your first sticking point. I think when you reach that first sticking point, now you separate the men from the boys, and that's where you start making progress. So what you do at that point is stop adding weights and just don't change anything. Still do this workout on Monday. Don't change the workout. Don't try to get nine. Just stop at eight on Wednesday and keep repeating that workout. And you'll find that slowly the body starts adapting. You've just added weight faster than it can keep up. 
And I've gotten to the point where I've gotten so overtrained that, let's see, you work out on Monday, it's Tuesday morning, you wake up, you're stiff. Um, Wednesday afternoon, uh, Tuesday afternoon, you zonk out, and Wednesday you're still stiff from that workout. What you do is keep working out Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, keep your weights the same. It can, has taken me as long as a month of not changing that workout for my body to adapt to get to the point where I can start gaining again. Where I say, well, maybe I can start adding a little bit. But um, overtraining is definitely not fun. You start feeling lethargic, and the last thing you want to do is go and lift those darn weights. But after a couple of weeks, it, it starts coming back. So you're basically, the body's sort of a masterpiece that if you give it adequate time, it will adapt to any activity. I don't know what that is. Any activity you give it, give it an adequate time. Okay? I've got pictures up here. I want to explain my question up here earlier was, can you bulk up doing this? I say the advantage of a raw food diet is that if you're going to stay closer to your contest condition. You won't get fat like a lot of bodybuilders and have to lose all that weight. So you'll look better year round. But I've got pictures of myself at age 24 when I won my bodybuilding contest. And then this year I decided to enter another one because I'm twice as old. I'm 48 and I want to see if, how close I can get to that condition. And he says, fairly close. Not as good, but um, fairly close. Okay. Could you hold them up? I'll get them on camera. Um, yeah, we've got, can you do that? Yeah. We've got, maybe I can show people where you can pass around. We've got age 24 here. Get this one down here. Okay. And we've got age 48 here on a raw food diet. Good age 48. So at 24, were you on the oh. sad diet? Yeah. I didn't know any better back then. I think with the resolution of the camera, it's not good enough to get the difference. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I still got the other one for good luck. And I thought we'd just give you guys a little <laughs> right. hello today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an extreme big bodybuilder. I just don't have the, the um, structure for it. I've never been, but done a lot better than, than a lot of people. And I uh, had an opportunity to compete in some bodybuilding contests, and I'll, I'll keep those pictures forever. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Where do you have your club? I sold my club because my um, I had to get out of that business because my wife and I are planning to move to Hawaii, oh, and we're gonna be I'm gonna be an organic farmer over there. But, where, okay. On the big island? On the big island, Hilo, yeah. So, where was your place? It was, um, the place was called, is a personal training studio called the Exercise Specialist in Santa Rosa. Okay. Yeah, so. Do you have any suggestions for beginning body builders? Suggestions as far as what? Books or... Uh, oh, yeah, I brought books. This kind of explains... Oh, where's that book? I think I left it out in the car. Yeah, I've got it on my website. It's called The New High Intensity Training by Ellington Darden. Okay? Ellington Darden has written a lot of books on bodybuilding, and he's used a lot of steroid bodybuilders. And my, my statement on bodybuilders is, if you run across a bodybuilder and he doesn't outright tell you, I don't take steroids, he's probably on steroids if he looks unreal like that. Okay? And that's why the contest I entered and also Kenneth Williams, I wanted to promote that organization. It's natural, it's drug tested, it's a clean, clean operation. But in these books, it talks about realistic results. And after, let's see, this guy, 18, six weeks added 19 and a half pounds. That's pretty darn good results. But still, he's not a professional bodybuilder. Okay, but following his routines, you get pretty much, the results vary from 10 pounds and six weeks to 20 pounds, but um, yeah, I say check out my website. I've got some resources there, but Ellington Darden's new book, The New High Intensity Training, is, is pretty darn good. Um, one last thing on protein I wanted to say is when people ask me about protein, my answer these days is what makes you think nutrition is all about protein? We got this book called The Prescription for Nutritional Healing, and in it it says outright on vitamin A, 
Protein cannot be utilized without vitamin A. Says, and what about you? So I say it's all about everything. Everything's tied together. If you don't get one thing, the body can't do its thing. It needs all those nutrients. That's why they're called essential nutrients. So we got our vitamins A, B, C, D, E, K. And think of all the minerals. Well, I'm say, well, you're worried about protein. What about your boron? What about your calcium, your chromium, your copper, your germanium, iodine, iron, magnesium, molybdenum? Phosphorus. Look at chromium. It says page 24. It is vital in the synthesis of protein. Okay, so I say it's more about all everything and not just protein. Okay, and Bradley says to wrap it up. So I hope I answered all your questions. Okay. 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 Okay.